Shalini Gadia, Dr. Vinod Gadia's wife. Oh, hello, hello, Dr. She's a GP. She's a very Hi. good friend of mine. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Nice to meet you. All the best for your meeting. Hopefully oh, thank you. Well. I'll thank be you. listening in the background. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Learn something. I'll call you after lunch. Okay. Hmm? Okay, then. Thank you. See yeah, you. Thank bye. you, dear. Bye, bye, bye. Alvin? Yeah. Is Prima listening? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, 64 you have got, is it? 68, no, you said 68. 68, okay, good. Mm -hmm. You're going to wait till all the 68 join? No, no, no. What we'll do, we'll, uh, it's uh, 17.59 now. We'll wait yeah. for another 10 minutes. Okay, okay, fine, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> or uh, quarter past six. Uh, another 15 minutes.
हेलो 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 गणेश सर आवाज येतो ना माझा हेलो हेलो येस सर आवाज येतोय ना माझा हा हा गणेश गणेश ना हो सर हो हो बरोबर हा येतोय आवाज ओके सर ओके हेलो मॅडम युट्यूब ची पण लिंक चालू झाली तर ती पण त्यामध्ये पण जॉईन करू शकतात सर्व ओके ओके फाईन फाईन चालेल विल जस्ट वेट फॉर अनदर फाईव्ह मिनिट्स अँड देन विल स्टार्ट ओके मॅडम गुड इव्हनिंग काय म्हणता सर गुड इव्हनिंग थँक्यू फॉर जॉईनिंग काय मी आता सीजर ला वॉश होते आता ट्रॅव्हलिंग करते मी आता पाच मिनिटात पोहोचेन हा तर मी आता वॉश झालेला असेल ऐकेन मी पण बोलता येणार नाही काय चालेल चालेल नो प्रॉब्लेम अरे अभि मी ट्रॅव्हल कर राहू अभि पाच मिनिट मी पोहोच जाऊंगा हॉस्पिटल ओके ओके हाय वैशाली हॅलो हाय थँक्यू थँक्यू हे दे कभी जा रहा हूँ हेवी ट्रॅफिक आहे हेमांगी मॅडम हॅज ऑल्सो जॉईन हेमांगी करणे मॅम ओके न्यूरो मॉड्युलेशन कादू मराठी बॉम्बे लाईक वॉट डू से ऑफिस बेर शेल वी स्टार्ट वी आर वी आर ओनली ट्वेंटी थ्री अनदर फाईव्ह मिनिट्स फोर मिनिट्स विल वेट अँड स्टार्ट क्या करणार रीना येस येस चलेगा वी कॅन स्टार्ट ना It's already or six fifteen. We can start three four minutes. Yeah. Good evening, sir. That's oh. fine. Hey, just just start. Yeah, let's. What? Mumbai, huh? Just a little. Ah.
Alvin? Alvin? Ja. Haha. Dr. Vinod, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Ah, okay, okay, fine. Thank you. So, uh, mm. yeah, we'll start then. Huh? Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, my seniors. Uh, SMS. Uh, Office bearers, Dr. Avinash Bosley, Dr. Balaji will join soon. Then uh, our faculties today, Dr. Albin Augustine and Dr. Vinod Gadiar. I welcome you all for this uh, webinar, which is organized by IS in Ami Mumbai. And thanks for uh, accepting the invitation to be a faculty. And uh, actually, 11th of December, is our uh, ISNI Mumbai's Foundation Day. And to mark this event, we have organized a webinar in association with SAMS, that is Society of Anesthesia Maharashtra uh, chapter. And uh, our theme today is uh, maintain and retain your brain. So we have two experts, Dr. Albin Augustine, he is uh, a consultant at uh, Stockholm Print. And Dr. Vinod Gadiar, he is also uh, a consultant and apart from the uh, consultant anesthetist and he is a chronic pain consultant uh, from Fairfield, Fairfield Hospital, Bury, Manchester. So they will share us uh, with their knowledge and we can gain a lot of uh, information from them. So without delaying further, we will start our webinar. The first speaker is Dr. Albin Augustine, and afterwards, uh, Dr. Vinod will share his knowledge. Uh, just uh, some rules I want to tell you. Uh, we have only speaker which will be unmute. Rest all will be muted and um, will be in mute mode. Uh, whatever questions you have, uh, please type, be, type them in a chat box. And at the end of both the sessions, we'll start Q&A session. And after all the questions are finished, if you want to interact with uh, faculties, you can interact. But while doing that, keep your mobile on silent mode. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead with uh, our first talk, which is anesthesia for stroke. Th oh, sorry, I'll have to share my screen. One minute. Huh? Can you all see me? Can you all see my screen? Hello. Yeah, I, I guess. Huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. Huh. Yeah. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Albin Augustine. He is an FRCA 
and he's a consultant neuroanesthetist at University Hospitals of uh, North Midlands in the UK. Uh, he did training in anesthesia from India in uh, from CMC Villon. And uh, he does neurosurgery list uh, in a week, neurosurgery, interventional neuroradiology and robotic urology. And he has special interest in uh, TIVA and simulation training. Over to you, Albin, now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, if you come off your screen, I can share my screen now. Can you see my screen now, Vaishali? Yes, we can see Albin. And you can hear me clearly, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vaishali, for the invitation, and thank you for all the um, <clears throat> distinguished anesthetists for sparing your valuable time on this Saturday uh, evening for you. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about how to give anesthesia because you're already experts, but I will share with you uh, the knowledge and experience we have in developing this new service and how we have gone about and how our hospital has implemented this and our results. So the topic is anesthesia for mechanical stroke thrombectomy. So this is where we are based. <clears throat> this is where we are based. Uh, this, this is uh, West Midlands, as you all know, UK has so many counties. And if you expand that map, we are in this place called Stoke-on-Trent. And it is a university hospital of North Midlands, it is called. That is where we all work at the moment. Fine. So this is the main entrance building. So this uh, hospital caters for about quarter of a million people. Uh, it has uh, all specialties, including neuro, cardiac, pediatrics. It's a major trauma center and also a stroke uh, thrombectomy center. What we do not do is uh, uh, children with major, major pediatrics and we do not do transplant operations. So this is the aerial view of the hospital. It all looks very nice from the top, but uh, you should believe me that it's totally mad and uh, very busy inside the hospital. Okay, regarding stroke thrombectomy, uh, this is about interventional radiology. I'm sure many of you work in interventional radiology, and uh, I'm going to talk about what we do there, and especially for today's talk, what cases we do in IR, the stroke pathway and various definitions, evidence for thrombectomy, the concept of penumbra and the core, how artificial intelligence is helping us, evidence for GA and optimum blood pressure for thrombectomy, how to measure quality and outcomes, what are the good metrics, what is a good unit, and the future of thrombectomy services for the United Kingdom. Right, so this is the intervention radiology suite. We have two intervention radiology suite. One is IR1, where they do all the abdominal aortic aneurysms and uh, vascular uh, cases. And this is the uh, other IR2, where we do neuro and also vascular cases. Right, okay, uh, sorry, okay. So the procedures, what we do in interventional neuroradiology as a neuroanesthetist group of seven or eight people covering this, normal cerebral angiogram, which you all know, coiling of aneurysms, we do around 100 in a year for subarachnoid hemorrhages, thrombectomy between 80 to 100, which it was like that. I will show you how it has changed over the years. We do embolization for AV malformations, dural AV fistulas, various cerebral tumors and for operations later, spinal cord angiogram and location of AV malformations, and some chronic brain procedures for cancer and then uh, degenerative disease, kyphoplasty and sacroplasty. Occasionally we do blood patch for chronic, sub chronic headaches uh, and some max maxillofacial patients will come for epistaxis as their, uh, as their tumor uh, area starts sloughing. Okay, so these are the cases. So, Anesthetists now are involved in stroke in various ways, ways. So it can be for acute ischemic uh, stroke. It can be for subarachnoid hemorrhage. It can be for intracranial hemorrhage. It can be for subdural hematoma. It can be for extradural hematoma. And for the MCA in fog where we do a decompressive craniotomy. So in all these facets of neurologic, neuro, <clears throat> neurosurgery problems, anesthetists or neuroanesthetists can be involved. I'm sure many of you are also involved in these cases in an everyday practice. 
let's go to the next slide. Okay, I'll start with the case report. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the internal carotid artery winding up and going into the intracranial region. It is full of dye. And this is what is the intracranial blood vasculature, which is not seen. So she was a 67-year-old female. Around 9.40 a.m., she was shopping in a place, supermarket called Aldi. She fell down. The 999 was dialed. Ambulance came in. She came around 10.30 a.m. to the accident emergency or the casualty suite. A clinical examination and CT was done. And then she was diagnosed of left dense hemiplegia with aphasia, a previous medical history of diabetes plus hypertension and increased, uh, uh, increased BMI. She had a middle cerebral artery thrombus and she was scheduled for alteplase and stroke thrombectomy was done. Uh, she was scheduled for that. Okay, so as she came into the interventional radiology suite, uh, the radiology intervention went through the femoral root, went into the carotid and into the MCA and you can see the clot a very dense clot being removed from her. After that, if you see this, this is the clot, and after removal, you can see the full perfusion of the brain, which is which which has completely uh, perfused well, and you can see the MCA ACA circulation well established. What I want to tell you is, after the circulation established, she started speaking and moving her left arm and left leg immediately on the operation table. So this is the dramatic effect she has. If you leave, if you would have left her only with alteplase or with no treatment, she would have been paralyzed for life. So this treatment is life-changing, a very dramatic treatment, which I will talk about more in the future slides. So this is our intervention radiology suite. As you can see, it's fully occupied by the radiologist and the radiographers. There's so many equipment inside. And via the anesthetist, you can see the monitoring monitor there, anesthesia machine there, and so much of radiation going on, so we stay outside. So anesthesia outside the operating suite, uh, operating theaters, as you all know, is very challenging and is very uh, risky as well. So these are some of the clots from large vessel occlusion. When I talk about large vessel occlusion, I mean anterior cerebral artery, internal carotid artery, and the MCA middle cerebral artery and its branches. These are the, some of the big clots which come out from the middle cerebral artery which causes our stroke or dense hemiplegia. For all practical purposes, I'm only going to talk about acute ischemic stroke. So stroke, as you all know, it could have happened in our own relatives, in our own family, and we can see even as doctors, many people come with stroke. It is one of the fourth leading cause of death in the whole of the world. It's one of the highest disability. So the disability and the rehab work and the family trauma and the health economics for the whole country and the, for the family is huge. So uh, there is evidence now to show that there's enough treatment for this and we have to work towards this to remove this highest develop, uh, disability from stroke. So this is the NHS England that is the National Health Service just like we have got in India, the Government Health Service, the National Health Service where you can see the budget is at least going to around 158 billion, okay? So that is the amount of money being spent on the National Health Service. And out of this, at least 26 billion is spent on, stro uh, on, on neuro and neurological and neuro rehab services. The budget for, for neurological disorders and neuro rehab is very, very high. One of the highest disabilities as I've just spoken to you. So the treatment available for stroke is either a drug, a clot buster, and now you can also go into the artery and remove the clot. So you've got intravenous thrombolysis and intravenous thrombolysis plus thrombectomy versus thrombectomy alone. So this is the treatment that is available. Now, this is, as you all know, uh, the alteplase, which was by NINS trial and ECAS trial in 1997. By the time it came to various countries, there was more than a 10 year delay. So this is this odds ratio line, you can see this line is for the no benefit. That is if you don't do anything, that is odds ratio one. And above this is if you do something. So this is the odds ratio on the Y axis. This is 60 minutes time on the X axis. If you see there is a clear benefit, clear benefit. And this benefit extends still till 150 minutes or nearly 180 minutes if you extend this. That is the low limit. So about up to, up, to, up to about three hours, you can give the alteplase or the clot busting glass. You will get benefit. 
This is where you get the maximum benefit where the confidence interval is so narrow. And then some of the patients will not benefit of because on the either side of the confidence interval. So there is definite benefit if you come in this first 120 minutes, a huge benefit. Some patients will definitely benefit even if you come later. Fine. And so this is where it all it all it plateaus off. After this 150 minutes, uh, there is almost no benefit at all. In fact, you can cause more harm because of alteplase or the cloud busting duct. So in 2008, the New England Journal of Medicine published this new trial with thrombolysis alteplase. You can extend it up to three, up to 4.5 hours, right? Okay. So this is constantly changing. The time is going to be up now. The best benefit you will get for three to 4.5 hours. Also, if you come after an acute ischemic stroke, it is beneficial. And so if you look at the, uh, to the American um, guidelines, ischemic stroke guidelines from the ASA, you can see alteplase is level one evidence, okay? It's level one evidence and everybody should get it between over 60 minutes. It should be able to, it should be able to uh, receive it in a hospital as long as we recognize the symptom of stroke and arrive early into the hospital and the hospital staff and the doctors recognize it and give the drug early. So as you can see, um, this is the number needed to treat. Number needed to treat is the inverse of absolute risk reduction. But if you come within 90 minutes, the number needed to treat is five, 180 minutes is nine, and 360 minutes is one. So the earlier you come, the benefit is greater. The lower the NNT, the treatment effect is even greater. You can make so much savings for that. Now, one of the, because we, we, we did not see this alteplase before in our practice, now patients are coming with strombectomy, alteplase infusion going in to, to the neuroanesthetist or to the anesthetist. We must be aware one dangerous side effect of the alteplase, which is angioedema associated with thrombolysis. So you sh and uh, especially if they are on ACE inhibitors, uh, you can, there can be swelling of tongue or swelling of the floor of mouth and oral pharynx progression within 30 minutes and may require intubation or an airway rest. So anesthetist should be aware of this. This is treated with histamine. I'm sure all of you know how to treat anaphylaxis and allergy. You're experts at it. Uh, you can give diphenhydramine, ephedrine, nebulized. Uh, um, uh, you can give nebulized epinephrine. And ultimately, there are alternative therapies such as C1 esterase inhibitors, which the hematology department will have. So for it is just for us to be aware of Angioedema, tongue swelling can occur because of this. Now, the problem is thrombolysis is not enough. Okay. Now, all patients who come, even if they get thrombolysis, it is not going to cause full recanalization of the large vessels which have been occluded. This is a big problem. So, if you see only 20% had acute recanalization, if you see the uh, M1 branch of the middle cerebral artery only 32%, M2 branch only 30%, basilar artery only 30%. And if in severe strokes, very severe strokes, thrombolysis is definitely not enough. So we need something more to remove the clot. So now here you can see this new technique where the radiologist goes in, goes there, there is a clot there. He goes in, pulls the clot, and there's full perfusion back again. So this is a, a big revolution in stroke care uh, and produces dramatic results. So this is the intervention radiology suite again, where you get all the patient parameters are there. This is the radiographer there. That is the scrub nurse there. That is the intervention radiologist going into the groin puncture and then going into the cerebral circulation to remove the clot. And this is how it will appear. And we are very far away. We should be with lead aprons and thyroid uh, protection aprons. Uh, and we can spend at least one hour to two hours in, in this suite for the whole procedure. And these are the devices that are being used, which, uh, which, are, which are called the stent retrievers or some are balloon retracted device where you go in and pull the clot out. Right, okay. So I'm going to tell how a patient from home goes to ambulance and then to hospital, then comes to a major hospital as scans and then ultimately goes to a stroke ward and then dis discharge. This is called the whole flow or the workflow pattern or the journey that a patient takes for when they have a stroke. So initially, patients should recognize stroke or the community recognize stroke or the relative should be able to recognize stroke both at home and at workplace. And this is what UK follows. There are various parameters, just like GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale. We have got the face, that is the face, the arms, and all these things that can, um, uh, that can go wrong. And uh, this is the face as a way of uh, recognizing uh, how are you going to 
uh, recognize stroke initially. So face, arms, speech, and time. So this is FAST. So FAST is uh, the acronym that is used for the test, just like Malampati test, just like uh, obstructive sleep apnea test. This is the initial screening test for stroke. As soon as fast, a patient is FAST positive, the 999 is being called and the ambulance will recognize these signs and they will rush the patient to a hospital in blue lights. Various countries will use different, different parameters. For example, some countries use race, some countries use FAST. And every, every uh, test, like, just like Malamperti, just like uh, Stop Bank Score, has their own sensitivity and specificity. Because of this low sensitivity and specificity, there will be very lot of stroke mimics. Many, many strokes can be missed. Uh, this can happen and there can be a more uh, overload in the accident emergency and workflow can increase. So it is very important to recognize stroke and uh, to make a differential diagnosis, make an accurate diagnosis so that they can reach early. So there are different ways. One is RACE, one is FAST-TD and GFAST. So different countries, I think Spain uses GFAST, UK uses FAST. So different countries will use uh, different methods. I think in India they are using FAST. So coming to our stroke um, uh, syndromes, that is the region of the anterior cerebral artery. This is the major middle cerebral artery territory. And then you've got the posterior cerebral circulation after this, okay? So I'm sure and we all have recognized this is the, the, the internal capsule, that is the corona radiata, internal capsule. The artery surrounding us will cause dense hemiplegia. So these are the various syndromes. I, all of you know this, I'm not going to go into detail uh, what symptoms we are going to get with this. This is the job of the neuro, uh, neurologist or the stroke physician to find and make a diagnosis and start the treatment. And this is posterior circulation. This is very important because there will be sudden loss of consciousness, nystagmus, there will be vomiting, loss of airway, bulbar weakness, aspiration, it can be Logdon syndrome. It is very important for us to recognize this earlier as an airway catastrophe and the mortality is very, very high, nearly 90% mortality you will get all in posterior circulation of basilar artery stroke. Now, just like Glasgow Coma Scale, patients can, uh, are given an NIHS score, that is the National Institutes of Health score. They go for uh, LOC, gaze, visual field, facial paralysis, so they have a score. I'm not going to go into details of this. This is the job of the neurologist or the stroke doctor who sees the patient initially and presents. So the NIS score, just like GCS, is divided into 0 to 4 minus stroke, 5 to 15, 16 to 20, and maximum score of 21 to 42. And the amount that you can see here, this arrow here, that is the middle cerebral artery territory. There's a big thrombus there. This is the CT angiogram. You can see on this patient's right or my left, where there is the middle cerebral artery fully perfusing. And here you can see the yellow arrow, there is a big thrombus here. So it's very easy to diagnose. And uh, we know... This causes, uh, this is stroke. If there is no blood, if there is a lot of blood, patient will go to neurosurgery. If there is no blood, patient will come to uh, the stroke physician. So again, there you can see this classic sign. And here again, you can see there is no continuity of vasculature. So there is a thrombus. It can be an arterial thrombus or it can be atrial fibrillation thrombus. Any of these can cause a big stroke. So what we have learned now is about uh, NIHS. That is one of the first term I would like to introduce to you. Now, the second term I would like to introduce to you is the Alberta Aspect Score or the Alberta Stroke Program. It's, I'll just call it Aspects. Now, what they do when they do scanning during both in the ganglionic level and the supraglionic level, the whole middle cerebral artery, they divide into various territories, M1, M2, M3, M4, and the, um, and the internal capsules, lentiform, and the uh, chordate nucleus, all these are given one, 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 one point all these points. Depending upon the infarction, they are given a score of 10. If it is 10 out of 10, the brain is normal. So as, e as each place is infarcted, they reduce one point and you, you're given a total score of an aspect score. So, uh, so, so this is used for to predict mortality. So the second term I would like to induce the aspect score. The third term, which I can see, this is the cutoff, this is the cutoff, and then after treatment, there is full perfusion. So depending upon the type of perfusion, we can also grade, just like you got the TIMI score in cardiac, uh, in, in myocardial infarction. Uh, this is called a TIKI score, that is it thrombolysis in cerebral infarction grade, 
where there is no perfusion, one there is clot reduction, and if you see 2B and 3 partial filling, 50 to 99% of the territory, number 3 is complete reperfusion. I like all of you to concentrate on this 2B and 3 because this is where we would like to achieve perfusion, right? Um, so, once again, with this reference, grade 2B is complete filling of all the expected vascular territory. Grade 3 is complete perfusion. So, we would like to achieve, the radiologists would like to achieve grade 2B or grade 3 type of TIKI score. So, we have seen what is NIHS score. And now, how do we measure the outcome? Once we do the treatment, how do we know the patient is survived? What we all measure on is post-operative nausea vomiting pain score, sedation score, like that they have what is called a modified ranking scale. So after the treatment, they looked for no symptoms, completely symptoms are gone, there is no significant disability, slight disability, or if you go to number six, patient has died or severe disability. So again, zero to six. So this is another term, modified ranking score. So in modified ranking score, here you can see there is uh, in score one and two, there is no patient is fine, can go back to work and the family is very happy, even mild, everybody is good, everybody is happy, moderate, they can dress themselves, they can eat, they can button their shirt, they can get up from their bed, whereas moderately severe and severe is bad, they especially moderately severe, they are fully dependent, they are in the bed, the family, the, the son or the daughter or the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law, everybody has to take care, or, or carers have to be employed and and then you've got severe stroke and then you've got that. So it is divided into dependent, independent, and then dependent. So dependent costs a lot of money. For example, in the UK, I'm sure in India, to look after a patient who is fully bedridden, uh, you have to comb their hair, brush their hair, turn them, toilet care, bowel care, dressing them up, teeth care, all this will cost at least 25 to 30,000 rupees Per, uh, per month, depending upon which city you're living. In the UK, because of social care, uh, the cost for the dependent people can be anywhere between 25 to 30,000 pounds a month. So the cost of health care is huge with stroke. So we all know this as anesthetists, we are very good at this. We know what is the blood supply to the brain, the gray matter and the white matter, the gray matter requires more blood supply. And this is the glucose utilization. As you can see, the glucose utilization the CMRO2 is 3 to 5. And this glucose utilization is very, very high. So it's an obligate glucose. It needs continuous oxygen and glucose supply. Okay. Uh, so the terminals which we have now gained are, we know what is NIHS. We know what is FAST. We know what is TIKI score. We know what is Albert's, Alberta score. We know what is modified ranking score. We know what is large vessel of which is ICA, MCA, anticervical artery. The other trends I would like to introduce now is by the time you the patient comes to the no door and has a venflon in or a cannula in to give thrombolysis, that is door to needle time, and then uh, and, and then gets out of the small hospital, so there is a door in and door out time. This is the CT angio to groin puncture time. So from the CT scan to groin puncture time, um, uh, we will measure, and this is called LWK or the last well-known time. And then wake-up stroke is sometimes in strokes, patient can wake up with stroke, unlike myocardial infection, because of pain, patient can get up, or because of shortness of breath and sweating, patient can get up and come to hospital, whereas stroke, they might even wake up as with stroke. So we do not know what time the stroke started. The other thing is called SICH, which is uh, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is a complication of alter place and blood brain barrier um, malfunction. So this is the middle internal carotid artery, middle cerebral artery coming in. That is the coronaradiator and internal capsule is here. This is where the various arteries come and feed. This is the, uh, uh, the this is the denticlostrite arteries. This is where you will get dense hemiplegia. So it's divided into various uh, branches: M1, M2. M3 and M4. If the clot is here, it's nice and proximal, easy to remove. As the clot progresses, it's more difficult to remove. Large clots will be here and here, and they all will need thrombectomy, whereas clots which are here may be dissolution, they may be, can be diluted with uh, alteplase. So this is the anatomy that we are interested in. So 
I would like to introduce also this, all of you know what is normal blood supply, normal cerebral blood flow, you know, as the blood flow slowly, slowly, slowly it comes down, there can be irreversible damage. This irreversible damage will lead to what is called an infarct and the infarct core, which you cannot do anything, but there is an area of penumbra which can be reversible. That is because of collaterals and various type of circulations and type of people. There is still a penumbra which has got decrease in blood supply or suboptimal function is going on, but it can be still be rescued. All right. So that is what we are interested in. So mechanism of escaping injury. So within about exhaustion of cellular ATP within four to five minutes. So this is really quick. Okay. Loss of blood supply in zero second by four to five minutes. There is death of cells and an infarct core develops. So this is the oxygen extraction uh, fraction that we are talking about. So the orange is where the core is. And as we progress towards the right, as you can see, less than 12 ml per 100 gram per minute, you get infarct cores of some 50. If you reduce to 12, you get a nice infarct core, which is not, you cannot reverse it. So uh, Saver in this stroke journal provided this. If you per stroke, if you, you can per second and per minute and per hour, you keep on losing neurons, yeah? Nearly 1.9, 120, 1 billion neurons are lost. And if you project it for, for aging, you age so much quicker. In, in this is functional aging, yeah? Not in chronologically functional age, you age 8.7 hours, so quickly all your functions are lost. So stroke can be really devastating as you can see from this. So the concept of time is brain because this is born, this sort, this, this uh, phrase is born from this paper. So time is very important, as we all know, for the, for the brain and its blood supply and the oxygen supply. And uh, because of this uh, new treatment, there was a revolution in acute ischemic uh, stroke care pathway, and uh, um, it caused very big changes um, compared to medical treatment alone. So this paper compared endovascular treatment versus medical care alone for stroke. As you can see in the year 2013, there are these three trials and you can see the forest plot. It doesn't favor, it's all neutral. It's still not very good. But in 2015, if you look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, nearly five trials to six trials were published and it clearly showed favoring endovascular treatment. So that's a big um, leap from in treatment from 2013 to 2015, you can see there is a big treatment uh, favoring endovascular treatment. So these trials were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Mr. Clean, Extend 1A, Escape, and there is Revascat and Swift Prime. All these trials proved that endovascular treatment is far, far superior to medical treatment alone. If you see the overall population, uh, this is the overall population, uh, this is how uh, uh, the white box is MR as 0 to 1 to 2. That means they are fully functionally independent. One uh, also less independent. And then 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 is death. 5, they are dependent. 4, they are dependent. So we are looking at 0, 1, and 2. That means they are fully independent. So look for mo modified ranking score of 0, 1, 2. So here if you see the control population is only 5 and then intervention pro population is 10. So there's a definite benefit. Even in people who are not eligible for alteplase, they may have a contraindication because they are allergic or they are very hypertensive or they had recent surgery, uh, uh, the, the benefit is very high. See, there is 10.2 here, it's only 3.6, and people who have even received alteplase, the benefit is very high in the intervention program. So there is no doubt that, uh, um, that uh, stroke thrombectomy is superior to medical treatment. Now, a highly effective perfusion, the, the, there is a group which were interested in all these trials and they came up with more data um, showing this, which favors, they put in various age criteria, aspect criteria, stroke location, NIH score, and from the onset, both for more and more than 300 minutes and greater than, and less than 300, more than 300 minutes, and they showed it favors intervention, okay? And the number, uh, the number need to treat, the number need to treat is coming to around 2.6. Now, no treatment in non-communicable disease has achieved a number of 2.6. It is very difficult, other than antibiotics, to find such a treatment for any disease. So NNT of 2.6 is really dramatic. 
as soon as you see this, every government and every healthcare um, healthcare institution should work on this to ready to offer the treatment so that the burden on the on the healthcare uh, of the country and the family is reduced. Um, next slide. Okay, so if you see mechanical thrombectomy 2.6. Keratid undoctrectomy is a fantastic operation. It's still NNT7, so very good operation. IV thrombolysis, uh, which I've been talking about, again, that's very good. It's 3.6 to 19, depending upon the time you come for stroke. And PCI or cardiac stenting or PCI is still 30, very high to prevent death. So 2.6 is one of is a fantastic number to achieve. And stroke thrombectomy is, is going to change. Uh, the treatment in future in all the countries in the world. So in 2016, these were the indications. You were 18 to 80. We had a stroke and large vessel occlusion. If you come within zero to six hours and NIH is greater than six and I expect score is greater than and six, you were subjected to thrombectomy. Uh, if you see the American Heart Association classification um, um, guidelines, sorry, yeah, on, for mechanical thrombectomy for zero to six hours, it is level one evidence. So time is brain. You have zero minutes and hours and days. You get a, a full infarct. So time is very, very critical. Uh, otherwise, the infarct is going to grow and grow. So in this uh, JAMA um, journal for time to treatment for endovascular thrombectomy, you can see it's a very important slide. If you see on the y-axis, time is moving from 180 to 43 hours, four hours, six hours it's going up this is the x-axis the percentage of patients so if you as you go up you can see this uh, uh, you can see the percentage of patient coming down so by 180 minutes and 240 minutes you can see it's going down and down. so timing is very very important the earlier the patient comes uh, the better is the modified ranking score once again modified ranking score is zero one two this is the benefit we are looking for Three, four, five, six are de uh, four and five are dependent, and six is death. So here, here you can see even once you come to the emergency department, this is sixty minutes. This is the percentage of functional dependence. It rapidly comes down. Once you come after one eighty minutes, there's rapidly come, but still there is there is benefit. And this is the line of no difference. About two seventy minutes after sixty minutes, you are there is no benefit. And this is also so after CT scan, you need to have yours around 300 minutes, there is almost no benefit. And uh, here is from, the, uh, uh, so this is for uh, three months for endovascular. This is looking after three months, that is 90 days after disability. You can see for about seven hours and 14 minutes, there is no benefit. So you can come up to up to seven hours if you still have an intervention. This is the line of no benefit. Up to there, you have benefit for favors thrombectomy. And here also it shows Whatever MRS, uh, all the MRS goes zero to five can be achieved if you come early. So uh, earlier uh, groin puncture or femoral artery puncture will favor good outcome. Now, <clears throat> the patients, uh, when they're coming through ambulance, either they will come to a small hospital or a district general hospital or an acute stroke center, or they can be taken to a big hospital called a comprehensive stroke center which can do intravenous thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy, decompressive craniotomy, and ICU admissions. Now, there is a confusion. What will the ambulance do? Go straight to the big center or go to a small center, receive thrombolysis, and then go to a big center? These are all debates that the network will organize depending upon where the patient location is. Is the big hospital nearer? Is the small hospital nearer? Depending upon the stroke severity, they will make this uh, decision which hospital to go. So either you can have a mothership model where you come straight to the um, big hospital or you can have a drip and ship model where they go to a small hospital, get their CT scan done, put the cannula in, get the alter place and then ship them into the big hospital. So when they do that, so this is they come into a small hospital from door to their thrombolysis through the thrombolysis to their cannula time is a door to needle time. Then once they leave the small hospital and go to a big hospital, it is called the door in and door out time, or they can come straight to, to the um, uh, angiography suite in the big hospital, that is door to door time. Once they come into the angiography, we are measuring the door to the uh, arterial puncture time, okay? Or they come to a big center, door to, door to thrombolysis time, and, and then hub to the uh, 
from the, uh, the arterial puncture time. So these timings are very, very important. Where the ambulance goes, how much time we take cut to do CT scan, how much time we take to give thrombolysis, how much time we take for thrombectomy. All these are very important times. So for every four minute delay in the accident and emergency unit or the casualty door to reperfusion, one in 100 will have a bad outcome. For every thousand patients, for every 15 minutes faster any door to reperfusion time, 39 patients would have less disabled outcome at three months, which is very important. So just 15 minutes, four minute delay, 15 minutes faster, an additional 25 would have a functional independence. So these are very, very important uh, uh, um, timings in, published in this journal. So what about strokes which are not witnessed or stroke after you wake up? Okay, so there are some trials. These are the diffuse trial and uh, for, sorry, diffuse trial for six to 16 hours. And then if there's a dawn trial, which you will get up to six to 24 hours, six to 16 hours, sorry, dawn trial and diffuse trial will be six to 16 hours. So even later, if you come, there is benefit for endovascular therapy. So in the uh, AHA uh, association guideline, even for six to 24 hours also, there is level one evidence. I'm, I'm not going in detail into both the dawn and diffuse because it's more of a neurologist thing, it is not. And what they do is, uh, what they do is advanced imaging, um, they, they just don't do a plain CT, but they, they do CT perfusion or MR diffusion, and they look at the core volume. Yeah, this is the volume, in fact, core volume, and they look at the um, the they look at the volume of the penumbra and the pore, and take a ratio and the volume and the age, and then make a decision whether they should have thrombectomy or not. So uh, when they come, this this is the dye they inject. The slope and, and the, the dye comes out of the brain. I talk, it, it all takes up in seconds. So the slope of that is will be the cerebral blood flow. The area under the curve will be the cerebral blood volume. And the time for the RBC to reach the peak of the brain will be the time to peak. And then you've got uh, uh, maximum time uh, to exit the brain. So all these times are computed. And then you get a picture like this of perfusion, just like the PE scan. You get where the defect is where the perfusion is, where the blood flow is, and then the core and the penumbra are differentiated between these two, and there is a ratio between these two and an indication is done. Now, for indication for thrombectomy was uh, between penumbra and ischemic core greater than 1.8, ischemic core should be less than 70. However, these things are all changing. This is just for our knowledge of what is happening and what the neurologist and the radiologist are doing. Um, so, we have a national guideline for stroke now, sorry, in 2023 and how ischemic stroke action. So, so much has changed. As you can see, all the age limits have gone now, even 80, 85, 88, even 90 year olds are, I'm very sorry, are being treated. You have more than 4.5 hours window is there for wake up stroke and unknown onset up to nine hours. You can have uh, treatment and known onset time more than nine hours. So what I'm saying is the hours are being pushed even more, even if you come late, uh, treatment is being offered and the imaging criteria still it is less than tell but this has gone to one recording point. in progress so many okay. people and so there is also automation automation in, uh, in imaging um, where you can bring artificial intelligence so much of data coming every patient comes very quickly so much data and imaging data and patient age data is there so artificial intelligence is being used there are two softwares one is brainomics and the rapid ai and these uh, uh, these trials are being fed into all these uh, into all these uh, uh, softwares, and you get uh, uh, the physician will get uh, uh, an update immediately once the patient factors are entered and the imaging is entered. You get where is the infarct, how much is the penumbra, what is the core volume. You don't have to interpret the whole thing, which will take time. So this software does it for you, and all the all the trials are being fed into this as clinical validation. And on the mobile phone, both the stroke physician and the anesthetist, we, we, we don't have this, uh, but the stroke physician and the intervention radiologist will get this so that they can plan very, very early. So all these are being very uh, done very early. It's, it's a mobile app. You can open it and see your patient. Even if they are in a small hospital, you will receive information early and you can plan. So all this is possible because of new types of devices. All these are the new uh, type of devices which are being now sold just like various generations are that are a new 
generations of devices depending upon the anatomy. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, there are two types, stent retrievers and aspiration catheters. So let's uh, skip all these things. This one I'm showing between these two devices. What I want to show is uh, some of the best centers where you get a groin puncture within 17 minutes of room arrival. And uh, the, the time from groin puncture to reverse aspiration is 25 minutes, 30 minutes. So these are very, very uh, uh, good centers which have produced these results. This is the closure device. Once the, uh, the cannula, once the femoral artery puncture is finished and the whole catheter system comes out, they close the femoral artery puncture with this device. Uh, these are the risk factors for stroke. Uh, you all know it. I'm not going to go through this. So various specialities are involved in this. This is the ambulance, the uh, accident and emergency or casualty stroke team, anesthesia team, CT team, transport team, intervention radiology suite members, radiographers, radiology nurse, anesthesia technicians, intervention neuroradiologists, recovery staff, intensive care staff, and the stroke ward staff. So the huge team uh, working on this, unlike hernia or appendicectomy, where only one, one or two teams are there. So this is the suite where they all work together. Um, and anesthesia for thrombectomy, what we do is it's an emergency. So you need to do a pre-assessment. We can't do that very much. Very less information will be available. Consent has to be taken. We always consent for cardiac arrest, the full AGBA monitoring, pre-oxygenation, rapid sequence intubation. You can either use CO-fluorine or TIVA um, um, or just sedation alone. Blood pressure should be maintained between 140 and 80. Uh, we don't put an arterial line unless they have cardiomyopathy or any valvular heart disease. Uh, no catheter, warming, good blood glucose control, give fluid and extubate, especially without aspiration, because aspiration is one of the commonest cause of deaths in all very sick, frail, and post-stroke, post-thrombectomy patients. Um, anesthesia, uh, it can, it's an emergency where you take quick history, look at the comorbidities. You can either give a local anesthetic or where you do nothing. Uh, and they take over if the patient is very cooperative or you, some patients can be very agitated, they need sedation or some people where the, the thrombus load is very high, the keratin is very tortuous and the patient is very unstable uh, and the intervention radio is very junior, they all demand general anesthesia. So GA is very, very useful for this procedure, which is very commonly used now. So before conscious sedation was a general, it was before... Uh, uh, thought that GA is very bad because we cause hypotension and all observational studies showed that sedation is much, much superior to general anesthesia and general anesthesia was frowned upon because of this uh, bad outcome with GA causing hypotension. Now, so we were waiting for a randomized control trial. This is the Goliath trial which came from Germany and this is a single central trial which showed uh, I'm going to go in between conscious sedation and general anesthesia. If you see the 90-day MRS score here, it's two and two. That means it says that general anesthesia is not inferior. In fact, it can be better. It can be even better uh, for uh, thrombectomy. So general anesthesia is slowly becoming better than conscious sedation. Now, if you look at uh, the neurology, uh, um, this, this paper, which came out recently in 2023, uh, which compared endovascular thrombectomy versus non-GA, and these are all the trials, siesta, uh, anstroke, goliath, uh, canvas and all these trials these are the various techniques different people use different different techniques um, and this is the summary of everything uh, siesta anstro goliath canvas all these are single 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 center study from china again single study and then france made this uh, gas study which is around four centers and now we have very good evidence uh, saying that uh, uh, ga is safe and superior it can be used now here if you see uh, it can be, uh, it is good if you take A, B, C, and D. A is for recalibration success, B is for good functional recovery, 3 is for mortality, and D is for hemorrhagic complications. For everything, uh, GA is favored. So GA is well controlled and it is a standard of care. Now, we can also use sedation and uh, uh, no sedation or just local anesthetic in the appropriate case, but GA is not harmful as it was thought before. Right, so um, so now GA is established an effective and recalibration group. There are class one studies, and this one summarized that it should go into the guidelines with GA as level 1B. So there is good evidence. So even for GA, we have level one evidence, and for thrombectomy also we have level one evidence. Now, some people thought that we should not do the, and the thrombolysis. Uh, this study clearly shows that 
um, you should uh, give TPA first and then thrombectomy. It is definitely beneficial. So not straight for thrombectomy. If there's indication for TPA, uh, we have to give thrombolysis also followed by thrombectomy. So this is the flow pattern. You have a stroke and then an onset. They have CT head or uh, um, uh, if it is zero to six hours, no need for advanced imaging. If you come after six to 24 hours, 64, you have more advanced imaging, imaging and then mechanical thrombectomy. So the main thing I want to show here is zero to six hours, no need for advanced imaging. After six to, 20, uh, six to 24 hours, you need more advanced imaging to find out how are the, what the core is doing. Fine. Um, these are the advantage, disadvantages. Advantages are patient is totally mobile. Disadvantage will be a lot of hemodynamic fluctuations compared to when you compare GA and conscious sedation. So uh, regarding, regarding blood pressure, these are the, uh, even a small decrease in blood pressure is, uh, um, is damaging. If you keep MAP greater than 90, you can see more people are benefiting the rate of good outcome. If you keep the MAP less than 70, there is a decrease in rate of good outcome. So blood pressure has to be up, the most important factor. So the guidance is not very clear. It's still only level two evidence. If the blood pressure is very high, you have to bring it down to 180 by over 105. To the what everybody is scared of is the hemorrhagic transformation if the blood pressure is very high, which will increase uh, which will increase mortality. So there is still not very good evidence, but its evidence is slowly coming. One trial which I want to show is the Enchanted Tower uh, trial, which came up in Lancet. They compared two types of blood pressure during thrombectomy. One is a very free blood pressure around 140 uh, of uh, less intensive. This is the blue is the more intensive control around 120. This is the diastolic. So one group is high, one group is low, which is intensive. If you compare this more intensive and less intensive, in more in less intensive group, the outcome is greater. So, and this trial was stopped earlier, okay, because people were going into poor outcome because of severe blood pressure control. So leave more intensive control and just do less intensive control. Uh, so the uh, these are the other um, randomized control trial, BP target, enchanted, best, and optimal. And all these groups uh, advocate uh, do not go into very low blood pressure, do not have very high blood pressure. Some were stay somewhere between 140 to 80 is what is recommended. So um, there is always controversy regarding this. The latest uh, editorial shows that 140 to uh, one, between 140 to 180 is a comfortable and we have to personalize uh, the blood pressure depending upon how the patient is uh, because of various other comorbidities. So we can also, regarding the type of anesthetic, so blood pressure we have tackled, now type of anesthetic, we can either use TIVA or sevoflurane, uh, or you can use sedation. Uh, so regarding comparing, this, this is a retrospective trial which came from Dubai and this showed, this, sorry, this showed that uh, um, inhalational, you get uh, only 12 and TIVA, you get 18. So there is some evidence that in retrospective analysis, TIVA is looking better. But I wouldn't, this is the wrong way of presenting. This is because it is retrospective. I'm just trying to show you that you can use different methods. And in this, TIVA is shown and I've got a bias towards, towards uh, TIVA. So next, uh, when we come as an anesthetist, we are going to induce in the anesthesia room. It will all be rapid sequence for all, fa all patients, whether fasted or non-fasted. You can use opiate, remifetal infusion, no need for arterial blood, intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring. You can just use blood pressure, maintain with oxygen air and seofluorine. Some patients are very elderly and frail. They will need very less MAC, but maintain blood pressure between 140 and 80. So you need metramidol infusion or refrigerant infusion or whatever vasopressor you would like to use. Post-operatively extubate and send to the stroke ward or intensive care as the case uh, warrants. Uh, sometimes the neuroradiologists will take a very, very long time um, in this. So this trial, which I got from the cardiology. So if the, uh, if the procedure takes 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and then 90 days, I'm yeah, sorry, <laughs> 60, more than 60 minutes, right? You see this red, uh, red bar, the red bar is there. The red bar is increasing, it is increasing, increasing. So the longer the interventional radiology spends, more than five, six, seven, eight attempts, the complications gets more and more. The complications being a hemorrhagic transformation and intracerebral hemorrhage. So we should try and bring the radio. They, they start enjoying in the, once they are into the cerebral thing, they try and get the best picture. 
oh, I need, I need more attempts, more attempts, but this will create harm. So first attempt is the best attempt, just like our laryngoscopic attempt and difficult airway. Uh, only two, three or four attempts should be good. You should be able to get it. Otherwise, you're going to cause more harm. Uh, these are the various complications all of you know because all of you are doing various procedures, uh, vasospasm, hematoma, hemorrhage, all these and anaphylaxis can occur. Um, and then also chondroinduced nephropathy, anybody who's got diabetes and greater than 75 years who are using non-steroids and previous renal impairment. The other thing which we are involved is the decompressive craniotomy. Some patients who uh, make progress into this, if they are not uh, treated uh, very well or they come late, there is the whole middle cerebral artery in a region can go into infarct. They can drop their consciousness, drop in an go, which will lead to herniation death. So we are involved in this. Uh, they are rushed as, uh, as E1 into the uh, operating room for decompressive hemicraniectomy. And there is good evidence that surgical produces better outcome in these patients. And uh, this is the outcome if uh, you get an NNT of 2 for survival and MRS score less than 4, NNT of 6 for survival and MRS score less than 3. So definitely below 60 years it is advocated. Over 60 years you'll have to do a detailed discussion with the family and though the benefit in fact patients might be living longer but they'll all be dependent and in a vegetative state so you should have a clear discussion with the family so there is a 23 percent greater chance of mrs at three at one year 42 percent reduction of mortality so it is definitely beneficial in patients less than 60. So how to measure? We're all doing all these things, but how do we measure quality? It's all very important to, though we do so many things, but are we doing the right thing? So this um, group uh, created a consensus and regarding quality and benchmarking. This is a very busy slide. I will break this down for all of us. Uh, so the standard should be from door to CT scan, 75% of the patients within 30 minutes. In best centers, within 12 minutes, you'll get a CT scan within 30 minutes. CT to groin puncture time, that is the femoral artery, 75% patient should be within 110 minutes. In good centers, less than 50 minutes. CT to groin puncture time, okay, uh, in, in, in page should be less than 80 minutes if imaging already done. So when the patients come from other hospitals or small hospitals, they already will have the imaging. So we should be even quicker in that. If this is with imaging in our hospital. Now in TIKI score, as I told you, should be greater than 2B within 60 minutes and no more than 10% of your patients should develop symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And of all patients treated, at least 30% should be independent with an MRS score of zero to two after 90 days. So this is very, very important. If we are not hitting this 30%, then we have to reevaluate our service and make changes. So this is the American Heart Association. They are very, very strict, okay, for, for uh, this is for uh, thrombolysis. Within 15 minutes, the a neurologist should see. Within 20 minutes, CT scan. Within 45 minutes, integration neuroimaging. And within 60 minutes, then they should get your thrombolysis or a clot busting drug. Now, for small hospital or acute stroke centers, uh, the door in and door time. If you can't do a thrombectomy, you just give thrombolysis. You should go into the hospital, get your diagnosis, get your cannula, do your CT scan, get the cannula, get alta place going, and get out of the hospital within 45 minutes and come to a major center for thrombectomy. So the other standards are um, there should be all cases of symptomatic heart it should be reviewed. Um, and then all patients have an NHS document over 24 hours and MRS at six months should be more than 45%. So these are the various standards we should be constantly auditing and benchmarking and improving our service continually. Uh, so these are the key audit that we that we all perform, 30-day post treatment mortality, uh, time from onset to M. M, M major thrombectomy center and time from arterial puncture to, to mechanical thrombectomy. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, our hospital was the first to produce in the whole of United Kingdom in 2014. We were doing this, this is published in 2013. So first mechanical thrombectomy ischemic stroke was serious produced from our hospital. Uh, and we had a good clinical outcomes in more than 50% of the patients in severe strokes. Uh, and then in 2019, our hospital produced this article where they compared out of service and the daytime service and whether the out of service is, is safe or not. So if you look at this timings of the hospital onset to door, that is from the symptom onset to door coming to hospital is 109 minutes. 
Okay, this is in hours and this is out of hours. And door to CT within 23 minutes and 21 minutes in in hours, out of hours. CT to groin is 104 minutes. That is very long. Procedure time is 55 minutes. Door to groin time, that is from patient coming into the hospital to the groin time is 124 minutes. So almost two hours it takes. And door to procedure end is almost three hours. So the whole thing takes around three hours to finish. I'm sure we can improve on these. And these from 2010 to 2019, this 2019, so I'm getting only till June, so only half. Uh, you can see the number of cases increasing slowly. It is increasing up to 86. And you can see functional independence was 9%. It is slowly going up to 39%. So we are hitting the 30% mark, which is very good. And from door to groin time, it should slowly, slowly decrease. It's come down to around 100 minutes, 118 minutes, it's come down to. So we are slowly improving and that can be more done. And it is comparable to various trials as well. So this is the June 2022 comparing to June, comparing to June 2023. Uh, again, our mortality is zero here. Mortality is 9% uh, there and, uh, and and door to CT time was 17 minutes, door to CT was 12 minutes in June, and uh, CT to groin was 65, and all these are very good. I don't want to bore you with all the statistics. Bore, even OH is out of our cases, door to CT 42 minutes, and average was 34 minutes the next year. And this is uh, similarly in July, uh, also door to CT is 22 minutes. Um, so the timings are slowly improving and which we can do better. So this is what we aim to achieve, door to groin punch of 60 minutes, door to groin punch of 45 minutes, groin punch of deployment of device less than 30 minutes and to full reperfusion less than six minutes. This, this is what we are trying to achieve and we are benchmarking to this and auditing the, our practice. So these were the statistics from 2019 to 2023 um, and uh, onset to door, our mean was 160 minutes, door to CT 25, CT to theta 49, we are able to give anesthesia within 10 minutes, anesthesia to groin puncture within 20 minutes for putting on the table, preparing, draping, and all those things. And from groin puncture to end of thrombectomy, they're able to achieve in less than 30 minutes. So what did all the patients come from? They came from our neighboring hospitals. So neighboring, our more patients come from our own place, and these are all the neighboring hospitals. So the first case, uh, UHNM published in 2015 in UK. 2015, all the trials level one evidence came. And 2016, there is an uh, institute called National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which gives all the various treatments and the recommendations to whole of UK. And then uh, UHNM was, sorry, I'll go back to that. Uh, and UHNM was awarded two uh, hospital journal awards uh, for, um, for, for, for saving the health economy. That is one title. And then producing improved clinical outcomes. So it's for health economy, and for improved clinical outcome, uh, we were awarded uh, um, the best uh, performing hospital award for that. And this is our stroke thrombectomy team, the radiologist and the stroke physicians and the uh, radiographers and the nursing staff. And uh, this is our consultant, Gahan Bose. This is Sanjeev Naik. He's one of the in very famous interventional neuroradiologists. And this is the team that performs the thrombectomy. So workforce, we have inter we have workforce, we have interventional radiologists. They have three or four of them, neuroanesthesiologists, one in seven now. We were one in five, one in six and seven. And stroke physicians, they are one in eight on call rota. That's what they do. This is our stroke ward. Uh, it is a 28 bedded ward, and they have got eight consultants. And the national mortality, if the thrombolysis rate is 11%, our hospital is around 17%. And the mechanical thrombectomy rate is 2.8%, which is higher than the national. Uh, I do not want to go into various details um, at this moment. Okay, so uh, regarding mortality, this is very, very important. National is 33% um, um, back to independent living, whereas our hospital is above the national average. And post-thrombectomy mortality, national is 16. Our UHNM is 14.7. So we are definitely doing better than the national average. This is a scenario in UK, uh, about 150 hyperacute stroke units. There are 90 interventional radiologists, around 80,000 strokes per year. There are 24, 20, uh, 24, I think, four interventional radiology centers who can do mechanical thrombectomy. And UK needs around 11,000 MTs, mechanical thrombectomies per year. 
So actually many people are missing out because services are not available 24 seven or even late in the night and many places radiologists and scanners are not available. So many people are missing out. If you take Europe, this is the stroke incidence, the red area, Turkey and uh, um, Turkey and, and uh, Greece and Italy, the stroke is very, very high. We've got intermediate in, <coughs> sorry, in United Kingdom, Scandinavian incidence is very low. This is the thrombolysis um, rate. Again, the red areas are very bad. Germany is doing very well and Scandinavia is doing well. UK is just doing just about okay. This is the endovascular treatment for thrombectomy. This was old data. The red people are doing very badly. Germany is doing well. Portugal is doing well. Um, uh, uh, and then Scandinavian countries are doing well. UK is not doing well in thrombectomy. It is still in red. There's so much to go. So there is a long-term plan for NHS. Uh, what they want to achieve is by 2025, they want to achieve the best performance in Europe. And by 2022, oh, sorry, by, 2020, by 2022, they want a 10-fold increase so that each year, 1,600 more people will be independent after their stroke. So for implementing this new uh, new pathway, there is a National Stroke Guideline. There is also the ninth uh, report of the uh, Sentinel um, Road to Recovery Audit. There is the uh, implementation guide for UK, and there is a framework for the West Midlands region. All these will uh, will be the pillars for improvement in these services. From this report, we can see the various places in UK: thirteen percent of thrombectomy, fourteen percent, nine percent. Okay, so the south of England is doing very well and the proportion of thrombectomy is slowly increasing. Uh, only 20% are doing 24 hours a day, 44% office hours and 36% extended. So all these have to do 24 seven to improve the numbers. Uh, some standard, main, some are maintaining quality standards. Brain imaging is done within 55 minutes, but there are various standards are, which are being also deteriorating. There are standards which have improved which is the thrombectomy rate from 1.8 in 2020 to 2.4%. So that is uh, very good. So some standards are improved, whereas there are some standards which have deteriorated. This is the national standard from 89 minutes, 90 minutes it takes. This is all during COVID time. So it took more time from onset to arrival, from arrival to thrombolysis. So within 60 minutes, many are receiving thrombolysis. Uh, this is how the various wards, this is the hyperacute stroke unit where you have 24-7 consultant available, whereas in acute stroke unit, it is only five days a week. So that's how the system is uh, being implemented. So this is England, which is 56 million and West Midlands is 2.9 million. So this is the area that uh, we are covering. 2.9 million is the population that uh, West Midlands is responsible for. And this is Stoke content where our hospital is. This is Birmingham hospital is here. This is the area that is being fully covered. As you can see, this is a 24-7 thrombectomy center here, another 24-7 thrombectomy centers here, and all other hospitals will be hyperacute or acute stroke units. So this is the ambulance trying, okay? All the orange ones will take a very long time. By the time ambulance reaches the acute stroke unit, hyperacute stroke unit will be more than 60 minutes. All the blue areas, they can reach within 10 minutes, all the other areas between 20 and 29 minutes. So your region and the ambulance distance will determine the uh, type of outcome you get. So here you can see the type, amount of uh, thrombectomies we're doing. This is 2017 18. This is the projection. This is the uh, Stoke Content Hospital year 63 we were doing, and it is slowly going up. It is going up to 67, and it is project, pro projected grand total of 167. It is going, uh, it is 133, sorry, 63 here, and it is going to be 133. So a good, big increase. I can tell you by, by December, we have already done around 187 thrombectomies in uh, in in this year. So definitely it is going up. That means other hospitals are sending patients much earlier now. Um, and uh, to come to our hospital, it will take, this is from this hospital, it will take around 52 minutes to reach from various places, 69 minutes, 52 minutes. Whereas through helicopter service, air ambulance takes only 10 to 15 minutes to reach the hospital. So you can gain more time. So. There is a hospital from, there is a new helicopter service available from another smaller hospital, but this is available only in daytime so that vital minutes are saved and the outcome gets better.
uh, and you just can't do only thrombectomy in primary care. This is the goal for the nation. You get atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. All these have to be controlled. So by 2029, 85% of the people with AF will be detected. 90% will be on adequate anticoagulation. You need to reduce people's blood pressure. By 2029, 80% of the blood pressure will be diagnosed and reduced. And cholesterol, 75% of the people by 2029 uh, will, will get their cholesterol reduced or have a cardiovascular risk assessment. So primary health care also you have to intervene uh, in a timely fashion to reduce the amount of stroke you get. So Saving Brains is a document which tells about various services uh, in this place. So England is doing 2.5%, whereas USA is doing 8.5% of all thrombectomies. That is very, very high. Other countries are high. England is still very, very, very low at the moment. It has to increase. Uh, now, nearly 5,899 patients have missed out on the treatment. Nearly 52% of the uh, stroke units have a consultant vacancies and all these are various problems. 42% of the stakes are not scanned within one hour and the, the UK has to spend nearly 400 million and that would be, be cost a save of, saving of around 1.3 billion over five years. So money has to be spent so that you can save on rehabilitation and rehab care. So these are the three guidelines which we use, 2023's National UK Stroke Guideline the AHA American Guideline and the European Stroke Organization um, estimate guideline for, for treatments and for the pathways. Uh, this is Maharashtra. Uh, Maharashtra's population 127 million and Mumbai population is 20 million. How uh, the Maharashtra government and the health minister will organize the scan centers and thrombolysis centers, how you will get quickly to hospital. This is a major planning. I'm sure every state and every city will do on itself and will treat its patient to get the best possible outcome. Um, so, conclusion. Uh, the evidence for mechanical thrombectomy is very, very high. You can need around 11,000 mechanical thrombectomies per year. You need to totally reorganize the stroke services and there should be increase in training of staff. Some of the general radiology consultants have to be trained in, uh, in intervention neuroradiology as well. And of course, the spending has to increase so that you can save money later. That is all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Oh my time. I'm not able to open. Huh. Dr. Alvin, excellent presentation. Excellent, very good. Thank and you. you have not only uh, told us about uh, management, but whole statistics. I think we'll come to questions afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Statistics yeah. and how should we improve practice? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So now we'll move to our second presentation, which is by Dr. Vinod Gadiar. And... I'll just share my screen. Can you see this? Can you see my screen? Can you all see my screen? Yes, madam. Yes. Uh -huh. So our uh, second speaker is uh, Dr. Vinod Gadia. Huh. Yeah, he's a consultant in anesthesia and pain medicine in uh, Fairfield Hospital, Northern Care Alliance uh, Group of Hospitals in Manchester. He did his MD from Kasturba Medical College in Manipal. He's been practicing as a consultant in the UK for the last 27 years. And he has special interest in chronic pain. And uh, he's an education supervisor for foundation doctors and his trainees, revalidation and appraisal lead for the hospital trust. He's an elected consultant committee member of BMA, British Medical Association in the UK. And uh, he is a chairman for British International Doctors in the UK, Rochdale and Bury Division. And national treasurer of British International Doctors Association in the UK. 
so dr uh, vinod gadiyar will tell us about processed eeg how do we monitor and uh, he'll tell, tell us in detail about uh, monitoring of uh, neuromonitoring other processed eeg and base monitoring and how should we apply that in our clinical practice over to you dr vinod Me, let me share that. Uh, okay. Can you see my uh, screen, Vaishali? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I can't see myself, uh, but that's yeah. all right. That's all right. <laughs> we'll be seeing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vishali, for uh, inviting me uh, and uh, thank you for your kind introduction. I want to say uh, what a fantastic talk uh, we have had by Albin. Um, I hope I can um, uh, live up to the expectation uh, on my talk here. Uh, and congratulations to him for uh, winning uh, a um, you know, uh, accolade in the country for their service. Okay. Thank you also to uh, the office bearers of uh, uh, and members of uh, ISA in Navi Mumbai. Um, I've not been to Navi Mumbai other than passing through, but uh, uh, now that um, I'm connected, I would like to come and visit uh, you. Um, greetings from sunny Manchester. Uh, it's winter here now, uh, but uh, today we have got a uh, very uh, good temperature of 11 degrees, uh, which is higher than usual for this time of the year, and um, it's sunny as well. Um, and I'm delighted to do, to do this talk uh, to the August audience, uh, uh, and I'll try and keep uh, my talk to as simple as possible and user-friendly uh, for a general anesthetist. And... Um, uh, please ask me questions, uh, which I will try and answer at the end of uh, the presentation today. So, um, I will just go through this talk uh, on following headings. Uh, my talk is only for about 20 25 minutes. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction, um, e.g., waveforms, uh, touch on depth easy. And what is by the uh, uh, monitor, uh, ECG indices, spectrogram, and how to make most of the EEG to administer a safe anesthesia, and some conclusions. So uh, I don't have any declaration of interest. Um, my um, this uh, I want to say that I'm not an expert in EEG, nor am I an academic. Um, I'm just a simple jobbing anesthetist. Um, the um, story about uh, use of EEG um, started in 1937 uh, when it was thought that um, EEG can be of help to measure the depth of anesthetic. And um, the process EEG, which was uh, to do with the spectrogram, uh, was uh, done for the first time in 1971. So I'm not talking about anything that is new here, but what has happened is um, um, we have had um, interest in uh, preventing um, the uh, depth, of, uh, sorry, preventing the awareness under anesthesia. So um, I put the depth of anesthesia here with an inverted commas. That meant that whatever you do, it's a, only a surrogate marker. And uh, uh, EEG uh, is one of the things that we can use to uh, prevent uh, uh, awareness and also to measure the depth of anesthesia. So there are four uh, bits that I'm going to talk about today, raw EEG and um, uh, processed EEG, spectrograms, uh, spectral edge uh, frequency, and uh, various indices. Okay, I'll go slowly and uh, um, just to talk about each of them. So uh, this is basic actually, which is talking about EG waveforms. Now, 
this is cricket, isn't it? Most of the times we think of cricket, yes. And uh, in EEG uh, waveforms, I think it's good to think of cricket. So um, it's a small mnemonic that I have. If you uh, win a toss, you just uh, want to bat first, isn't it? So get batted. So from the bottom here, G is get batted, B-A-T-D, okay? So that's how to remember. Um, so the waveforms are measured uh, by number of beats in a uh, number of amplitudes in a second. So if there is only one, like here, this one, one hertz. If there are five in a second, it's five hertz. If there are eight in a second, it's eight hertz. So um, if you look at from the bottom again, get batted, uh, gamma waves. Gamma waves are uh, at a frequency of uh, 25 to 30 or 35 up to 80 actually. So, and then there are beta waves. So in a second, you can get between 12 to 25 or so. Then the alpha waves. Alpha waves are from uh, say about eight to 12. And then theta waves and delta waves and slow waves. So I'm going to talk about some of these waves as we talked about uh, talk about depth of anesthetic and how we use EEG. Okay. So from the top here, uh, we got uh, a, a wake patient who has got um, this kind of waveform, uh, which is mostly uh, gamma. And uh, as the patient gets into anesthesia, slow, in, slow induction of anesthesia, there will be a bit of paradoxical excitation. And you can see the waveform is changing. And uh, this is mostly beta oscillation. Okay, And the patient becomes even deeper and the alpha starts to appear along with the low beta uh, waves. And the patient uh, uh, achieves unconsciousness and surgical level, you get slow uh, beta as well as alpha oscillations. So alpha meant, as we, as we were talking about, uh, per uh, second, about eight to 12 um, uh, waves. And uh, once when the patient is unconscious uh, at induction of anesthesia, you'll see these waveforms like a waves in the uh, sea, um, which is delta. So delta is uh, lower in frequency, maybe one to four. So if you have um, anesthesia even deeper than that, that is when we get this the waveform here, and that is called as burst suppression because the whole of the EG is suppressed and you will get almost like a line but in between there is burst. So if, uh, that is why it's called as burst suppression, burst and suppression. And then um, even deeper levels, you can get complete isoelectricity like a flat line. Okay. So in uh, clinical practice, what we do is we measure the um, frontal EEG. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, one of our trainees, uh, so sorry. Um, so um, we put, this is a, a, a BIS monitor that we are using. Um, so the electrode is placed on the forehead. Before we put the um, electrode, we have to nicely clean the area uh, so that we don't have any uh, problem with the impedance. And then um, it is connected to the monitor. So, Electrodes are placed over the forehead to record EEG from the frontal lobe. Then the EEG is being uh, uh, transmitted onto the monitor. Uh, there is a process there called as fast Fourier transformation, which dissects this waveform into principal components of frequencies. See, uh, and uh, it is there is a uh, number that is derived from these, um, and uh, what, this is one of them. Uh, so you may have you may be using BIS. So um, BIS has got a number um, from uh, uh, zero to hundred, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
So there are variety of um, monitors which give an index number. And um, then there is also um, how a mathematical model, which uh, also gives you uh, a power spectrogram. Okay. But uh, whatever you do, I want, I, I think one has to correlate the clinical findings with these parameters. You can't say that the base is high, so the patient is light. No, you have to look at all other things. Okay. So now let us look at uh, uh, the uh, monitoring, why we are using uh, uh, frontal uh, lobe or uh, why we are, uh, how it helps us to uh, measure uh, the depth of anesthetic as such. So at the front here, we have got a frontal cortex here. And uh, one in yellow is the thalamus. So um, most of the uh, times, the uh, thalamocortical uh, uh, pathways are very, very active. And uh, once when the, so uh, the, the, there are uh, cells in the uh, uh, cerebral cortex, which are called as pyramidal cells. They are like a cone with the top, like a dendrite. So they are all parallel to uh, they are they are all parallel to each other and they're perpendicular to the uh, scalp. So that renders it to uh, be a very nice. Um, uh, uh, so they are very available uh, to have uh, the uh, EEG being uh, monitored. So you can see a scalp uh, electroencephalogram waveform, which is measured from the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. Um, but can, just there's a, there's a question. Yes, if the thalamus is so important, why is that we can't measure thalamus uh, uh, EEG? Because it's quite deep and it is very difficult to measure the uh, EEG from thalamus. However, because the cort uh, uh, corticothalamic uh, pathways are so robust uh, and um, when we uh, depress the uh, corticothalamus uh, pathway, um, whatever we are looking at uh, the cortical uh, EEG, is probably a measure of what goes on in the area of thalamus or in the midbrain. Okay. So let us talk about uh, index numbers. So index number is, one of them is BIS uh, or bispectral index. Um, it's a commercial uh, uh, monitor, which gives you uh, a number between 99 to zero. It was because what happened in the 90s is that there was a renowned interest to re, um, have monitors to reduce the incidence of um, the awareness under anesthesia. That is why so many monitors were introduced and uh, to make life easy, they said, okay, we'll um, as, uh, uh, have EEGs processed and um, some other bits are thrown in there. And then a algorithm was uh, uh, made by each company. And this, and they did uh, some studies and showed that if it is if the basis between 40 and 60, probably it is within the clinical range. Uh, it's not exact science again, okay? So there are at least 10 monitors that are available uh, currently, which do uh, uh, the similar job like this. Uh, I have known about entropy and sedline or Massimo uh, monitor there and it's easy range is between 20 to 50. There is Narcomed, etc. So what is the advantage of uh, having an index number or a base like wire numbers? It's a simple numerical value. So you can say, okay, the base is below 40. Uh, Oh, sorry, this is about 40 and below 60, we are in the anesthetic range. Uh, but what are the disadvantages? So you just imagine yourself looking at the heart rate, the number, and saying that, okay, uh, this is the heart rate. But you have never looked at the rhythm, heart uh, uh, ECG rhythm. So that, it's the same thing. So it's better to look at the waveform, EG waveform, understand what is happening, and then look at the number. Okay. 
because uh, the waist numbers can be affected by the EMG muscle movements, artifacts uh, due to external sources such as cautery, electrical fields, physiological pathology, and um, like hypotension, etc., uh, biological age. Uh, and it's not that as soon as you measure uh, the EEG, it is uh, right on time. So there is about a 30 seconds lag between the measurement of e, uh, base and it is dis displaying on the monitor. And uh, you can't say that, you know, because people are different. Uh, people have got, uh, uh, and th there are various types of anesthetic uh, uh, that you can do with different type of agents. Uh, so each of these will show different uh, morphology of uh, EEG and we can't use only one index or one algorithm for all these. Uh, so this is the disadvantage. For example, uh, if you use ketamine, uh, nitrous oxide and uh, even ephedrine, it may show higher bis even when the patient is anesthetized. Um, and also dexmeditomidin. Um, if you look at the waveform, uh, you may think that oh, the, this patient or the base, this may, patient is completely uh, anesthetized, but you can easily wake them up. So just a few words about awareness center anesthesia. So EEG index, uh, indexes, uh, uh, as I was talking to you, became popular with a view to prevent awareness. But there's a difference between awareness and recall because some patients may be aware but will they recall what happened? That's much lower than just awareness. Um, they, they have done a lot of experiments with what's called as isolated arm technique because uh, you um, isolate the arm by, with the blood pressure cuff and uh, uh, anesthetize the patient and you would have instructed the patient beforehand as to how they have to respond if they hear you. And uh, they would do that one even under anesthetic, but they won't remember what uh, they have uh, done uh, when they were asked to do certain movements uh, under anesthetic. So there is no recall, okay? So what is the incidence of uh, awareness under anesthesia? So it may be between 0 0.005 to 0.1%, depending on the study that you look at. But in general, if you look at all the papers, um, they quote a figure of about one in a thousand, which is 0.01% um, to, um, Sorry, 0.1% to 0.2%. Um, but uh, the incidence is known to be more in uh, pediatric patients, obstetric patients, cardiac patients, and uh, uh, more in female patients when compared to uh, male patients. Okay. Um, in the UK, there is, um, we got Royal College of Anesthetists and they do um, audits, which is National Audit Project, short for NAP. Uh, and uh, uh, there are various uh, um, uh, NAP studies, uh, sorry, audits have been done. And the NAP 5 was uh, uh, done to address the question of the depth of anesthesia. And their findings are that um, they called it AGA, which is Accidental Awareness Center General Anesthesia. So there were 2.8 million records, uh, patient records were looked at, and out of which there were 147 cases of uh, awareness under general anesthesia. So the estimation was one in 19,000 or 0.005%. And if you use the TIVA, the incidence was slightly higher, um, one in 14,000. And the incidence, if you use the uh, neuromuscular blockers, then the incidence was even higher, one in 8,200. Um, and uh, in uh, patients who are undergoing uh, uh, caesarean sections and the general anesthetic, it was one in uh, 670. So, but the, most of the um, uh, awareness uh, that they have quoted in uh, NAP5 were for less, less, five minutes or less, but 50% of those suffered from uh, psychological consequences. Okay. One third of the, uh, the this is interesting because uh, one third of these cases happened during the maintenance phase. That meant two thirds happened at induction and emergence. Um, so um, because we may have patients who are obese, um, who may have had um, um, 
uh, airway difficulty, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, patients uh, who came for emergencies, all these patients are vulnerable for um, um, awareness and anesthesia, especially at uh, induction. Okay. So uh, NAP uh, said uh, that uh, uh, processed EEG is recommended during anesthesia, especially if you are using TIVA and uh, relaxants. But how about uh, use of uh, um, uh, depth of anesthesia monitoring of some kind, even for inhalational anesthetic? I think uh, I'll talk about uh, association of anesthesia guidelines in a minute. Okay. So basically, there are various areas of brain which are depressed um, uh, during anesthetic and uh, uh, or um, even otherwise, what, what constitutes an area of interest with each of the modalities that are on the left side here. Uh, so the consciousness is mainly to do with the thalamocortical uh, component. So that is where uh, we get um, depression of uh, thalamocortical pathways, and uh, that's what we are measuring from, from consciousness point of view. However, other things have to be depressed as well, like uh, autonomic nervous system, uh, etc. So what happens if you had uh, too deep anesthesia? Okay. And uh, when you have too deep anesthesia, as I was showing you earlier on, you can get a uh, anesthesia-induced burst suppression, the EEG becomes almost flat or you may have a little burst of uh, uh, waves there. Uh, elderly patients are mo oh, mostly vulnerable for this. Um, but what can it do? It can cause or it can increase the incidence of post-operative delirium. And in uh, there are some papers which also say that cognitive decline can happen, but there is not much proof for the uh, POCD. However, uh, lots and lots of papers have said that uh, post-operative delirium uh, can get worse. And also it can wor worsen morbidity and mortality. So giving 2D panacea to prevent uh, anything uh, may also may not be a good idea. Um, so I have uh, seen that uh, because we are... Uh, I do a lot of patients uh, under uh, uh, TIVA anesthetic, and um, I have always used uh, uh, BIS or uh, BIS uh, mostly, and um, that has helped me to um, take the imagination out of doing anesthesia. So, um, other thing is also that uh, I'm probably using uh, much less of the anesthetic agents because when we don't use uh, any of the um, EEG monitoring, we tend to overdose the patient with anesthesia agents. So this is what I was talking about. Uh, Association of Anesthetists brought out uh, guidelines uh, for monitoring during anesthesia. And uh, this was the latest edition in 2021. And what they have recommended is that one should use processed EEG um, uh, during uh, anesthetic, especially if you are using TIVA along with the neuromuscular blockade. And monitoring should start before induction and continue at least until full recovery from the effects of neuromuscular block is uh, confirmed. Also, there is a role for uh, processed EEG when uh, in patients who are uh, getting or receiving inhalational general anesthesia. This is because um, uh, if um, uh, patients had uh, uh, awareness during uh, induction and at the em at emergence, according to NAP, um, more than during maintenance, um, you using uh, entitled uh, uh, concentrations of uh, you know inhalation agents is not going to prevent it. So I think um, uh, Association of Anesthesia certainly uh, recommends that we should use uh, uh, um, EEG monitoring uh, for all type of anesthetics. Uh, this is my diagram here. I'll, I'll try and see if I can uh, use this pencil. Uh, yeah, so this is the line uh, which is like a, this, this, this whole undulation is delta wave. So we are back to the waves now. Um, 
So delta wave is probably 0 0.1 to 1 second, uh, one wave per second. So this is one second here. But on top of the uh, delta waves, you have got small waves here and they are alpha waves. Okay. So the alpha waves are there on the uh, peak of these waves. And the trough, we don't have much of these alpha waves, alpha spindles. So when the patient is uh, anesthetized um, with propofol, for example, and uh, propofol and Remy anesthesia, you get uh, this delta waves and alpha wave, alpha spindles. Yeah, so this uh, uh, diagram here or this picture shows uh, that um, the EEG is being measured here, but it's at a, a higher speed of probably about 6.25 milliseconds. So uh, on, on the, this is the y-axis, which is uh, time, and on the x-axis is uh, Sorry, uh, on the horizontal axis is the time and in the vertical axis, you have uh, the uh, waveform, which is um, uh, the amplitude is measured uh, the in uh, um, measured there, actually. Yeah. And if you look at this one, this is like a delta wave, which is in red. And uh, if you look at this is a slower waveform here. Um, uh, and uh, you, you, this is one of these waves split uh, shown here slightly in an elaborate manner. And you can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 waves are there within uh, one second. So what is it? It is alpha waves. Yeah. So other day uh, when we were anesthetizing one patient, uh, I just looked, uh, we had uh, uh, given propofol uh, for induction and the BIS monitor showed that the patient uh, had uh, a lower BIS of about 14. Um, so uh, you can see uh, this is the uh, uh, EEG waveform, uh, but it is showing now the ECG. So you, this, you, can, you can see sometimes uh, this type of pattern. Um, and uh, on the other side of that, uh, I can uh, point, to, point to you a couple of things here. Um, there is something called as SQI, which meant that signal quality index, because it measures the quality of this and uh, say this SQI is about 100. That means it's a good quality. Um, waveform and there is EMG because um, uh, if, if you put the uh, 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 stickers on the forehead, it can measure uh, the uh, movements of the frontalis muscle, uh, which then is displayed as EMG here. So EMG under uh, a good anesthetic uh, is about uh, 20 to 25, 26, etc. But if EMG is in its 40s, that, that means probably the muscle uh, is active and probably um, there is some interference from the muscle movements. So I'll just slightly uh, change gear here uh, and uh, get into what is called as a power spectrogram. So you, you anesthetize the patient and you will have, uh, uh, say, um, Al alpha wave, alpha spindles over delta waves. Uh, but what we have to do is we can't keep on seeing this one all the time. What we need a trend of what is going on with the, these waveforms. So uh, what they've cleverly done is uh, to have uh, um, a mathematical model of uh, this. And um, there are three things here. One is time on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you have the uh, uh, um, uh, amplitude, which is measured in microvolts. And also you have got the each wave, which has got its own frequency. So it's a 3D uh, construction, but when you look at it, it's in 2D here. Okay, so, so if the amplitude is higher, uh, then 
the power on the right side is ha uh, higher. Okay, I'll try and uh, so th this is the uh, delta wave and this is the alpha wave here. And when it is constructed uh, in a 3D fa fashion, you get this kind of picture. It is almost like you can imagine yourself looking at all the waveforms or uh, in a row, hundreds and thousands of them, uh, but uh, they are making uh, like a, uh, uh, mountains and valleys. And you are looking at these mountains from the top. Um, and uh, that's the picture you will see here as a spectrogram. So I, in here, I will explain that again to you. So there is uh, time on the x-axis here and on the vertical axis, you have got frequency. This frequency is of each wave, like it may be an alpha wave or a delta wave, as I showed you earlier on, there are delta waves. On top of that one, you've got alpha oscillations. And on the right side, you can see that depending on what type of waveform is predominant and high power, it's called as power, and uh, that is uh, displayed in a, uh, a color diagram here, uh, and it's measured in decibels. So if there if the power is high, then it is uh, shown in red. If the power is low, then it is shown in blue. In this uh, spectrogram here, you can see the gamma waves are at the top. Actually, gamma waves, as you can, uh, as you remember from the, what I was, uh, what I've been saying. A very very uh, high in frequency in awake patient you get gamma waves and uh, when when the star patient starts to go to sleep uh, then you can get high beta and then low beta and uh, alpha uh, this is the alpha wave here which is in red on the top and the bottom red is the delta wave so you can also have some theta waves in between so this is a I'll just uh, go to the next slide. So this is what I was ma monitoring the other day when I was uh, um, uh, or doing anesthetic for one of the thyroid patients. Um, after induction, uh, it is like this. This is the alpha pattern, alpha wave. And at the bottom, there is delta wave. And that is like a train track. And this is typical for um, uh, remifentanil and propofol uh, anesthesia spectrogram. Our BC is 48, and you can see the raw, raw EEG waveform here. I, I think it's showing a, a wavy form. That's the delta wave. On top of that one, there are alpha spindles. The alpha spindles are there. This is alpha spindles. And this is 25 millimeters uh, per second speed. So uh, one uh, uh, second is one block actually here. So eight to 12 waves uh, in a second. So propofol and remifentanil are uh, TCI, each anesthetic to you, each of these anesthetics have their own fingerprint. So for propofol and remifentanil, you get alpha delta pattern. So sorry, I'll just try and uh, rub this off. So um, if you look at the, this waveform again, I'll explain to you uh, that you got a, a red line here, which is around, uh, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, um, frequency is about uh, 10 to uh, 8 to 12 or so. And, uh, and then at the bottom here, there is another uh, red block, which is a, a, a frequency of about 3, 4 or so of... Uh, uh, three four hertz so that is delta wave and then there is alpha wave so alpha delta pattern so alpha delta pattern um so if you are uh, anesthetizing a patient with the co fluorine uh you can get still get alpha delta pattern but uh, the uh, later on the theta uh, becomes uh, stronger so this is the um uh, alpha wave here and uh, at the bottom, there is uh, red, which is the uh, delta. And in between, you get um, the um, theta waves. Um, and you can see that, say, for example, here in this diagram, the uh, anesthesia was started with the 
uh, sorry, maintained with 1.1% CO florin and the CO florin goes up. So there is more and more depression of that. And once when the entire CO, the CO florin is 2.8%, the patient is probably deep and you can get burst suppression. And burst suppression is like vertical lines that are shown in here. What about ketamine? Um, ketamine is, uh, as I was explaining to you earlier on, ketamine uh, shows a different EEG pattern. And because of that, we can get a higher base number. So uh, it shows alternating delta and gamma oscillation. As you know, gamma means um, there is um, increased frequency about 30, 35, 40 like that. So that is why it is more in blue here uh, and um, also, there is a bit of delta here at the bottom. So this looks much different to the um, alpha delta pattern that you've seen for uh, uh, anesthesia with the propofol or even uh, cefluorin. What about dexmedetomidine? Dexmedetomidine is one of, as you know, it's a one of the alpha two agonists that uh, uh, you may well, we you use in uh, ICU mostly. I have not had. Uh, much uh, chance of using it uh, in uh, anesthesia, but it is uh, very good for um, using for procedural sedation. Um, so it uh, actually, if you look at the waveforms, it resembles stage two of uh, slow wave sleep. So there are slow delta oscillations interspersed with the spindles. And uh, ECG uh, may, it's an EEG may give an impression that the patient is deeply anesthetized, but you can easily wake the patient up. So that's the pattern that you see uh, when you have a patient uh, with the dexmedetomidine uh, sedation and um, the um, there is delta there and there is a little bit of uh, uh, alpha as well, but mostly they are, um, uh, if you look at this pattern, uh, you may think that patient is fully anesthetized, but they're not, they're only mildly sedated. Okay, so just as a reminder again, with the proper fall, you get alpha and delta pattern like a train track. With the CO florin, you can get a similar one, but in between you may have theta. And uh, again, ketamine, uh, it is more uh, of uh, uh, gamma uh, and a little bit of delta there, uh, definitely different looking to proper fall and uh, uh, Cioflorane, uh, dexmedetomidine, again, um, this is the type of pattern you get. So all I want to say is that um, every uh, one of these anesthetics you look at, uh, you have to look at the spectrogram. Otherwise, just looking at these numbers or even the waveforms may or may not be uh, giving you all the information. So uh, what about increased age? Uh, the um, uh, With the increased age, the alpha power gets reduced and uh, burst suppression is more evident. If you look at this diagram in here, um, this is um, a, a person uh, who is um, a, in, in the lower panel, I can say that uh, a, the uh, propofol uh, general anesthesia, uh, you can see the alpha and delta waveforms are there in patients who are up to age of 65. But after that, this alpha becomes a bit less prominent. So another thing, uh, concept that I want to introduce here, it's called a spectral edge frequency um, because uh, all the uh, um, spectrogram that we have seen so far, the it is um, uh, measured with the power at the bottom there. So whatever uh, power uh, of uh, the spectral edge, uh, sorry, spectral spectrogram is there. And if you, uh, there are two lines that you can draw there. When which has got uh, spectral uh, power, 95% and then 50%. So all the spectral edge frequency is a frequency below which 95% of the power is present in the spectrogram. And it is closely related to alpha wave uh, spindles in one second. So about, uh, say about uh, the alpha spindles are about 10 to 12, uh, miles our spectral edge is around 12 or 13. And uh, it starts to go up as the patient wakes up. I'll just uh, show that again on this uh, spectrogram, which you have already seen uh, with the propofol anesthetic, which is alpha here and delta here. And can you see this white line? That is the spectral edge. 
uh, frequency, and that's around uh, 12 or 13. So once when the patient starts to wake up, it starts to go up, actually. And uh, if the patient uh, is becoming a bit more awake, the spectral edge will go up. So you can deepen the anesthetic to bring the spectral edge around the uh, uh, um, uh, you know, amplitude or um, even frequency that was there beforehand. So what about patients who are uh, uh, using chronic uh, uh, opioids? There are some studies which are a bit controversial. You would imagine that uh, they need more anesthetic. Yes, they, I'm, common sense tells me that they need more anesthetic. But some there are some papers which say that they may re even need or require less drugs to maintain anesthesia. Uh, what about chronic pain? So that's a little bit of uh, my interest. Um, chronic pain patients may exhibit changes in theta frequency band, which is not observed in uh, opioid naive patients. So in conclusion, um, I want to say that there is a lot of advance in EEG technology uh, that has prompted the use in uh, anesthesia, especially to prevent an uh, awareness under anesthesia. So EC EEG definitely has a place in modern anesthesia, more so when you are using uh, mus uh, TIVA anesthetic and muscle relaxants. However, I recommend that the EEG monitoring is used for every kind of anesthetic that you do, um, general anesthetic that is, um, that, that, the, that will take imagination out of anesthesia. Uh, appropriate use of EEG may reduce the incidence of post-operative delirium, especially in elderly patients who will go back to the ward and uh, they don't know what's happening to them. Uh, so if you can manage their anesthesia by uh, using appropriate amount of drugs, uh, not too deep anesthesia that is. So understanding of waveforms and processed modal modalities such as spectrogram and spectral edge frequency is important in addition to the indices such as uh, BIS, for example. So I would say that one should not entirely rely on the BIS numbers without seeing the waveforms and also correlating with the patient's conditions such as hypertension, hypotension, uh, use of various types of anesthetics like nitrous oxide, ketamine that can increase the uh, BIS numbers. Okay. I have got a lot of articles. If you want me to share with you, I can share it with you. Uh, but I would urge you to uh, look at these two websites uh, and uh, they got fantastic amount of uh, information and also videos, um, istap.org or eeg for anesthesia, iars.org. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aishali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, here only. I'll try. I'll, shall I stop sharing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod. Excellent presentation and detailed explanation of process EEG. I've been after you for so many months. Very good. Uh, so I will open this session for queries and questions. But before that, I have uh, uh, one question. Can you go on your slides, please? My slide? Yes, please. Or I can, uh, yeah, please. In uh, slide number 25, 26. Right, let me just go back again, share the screen. Yeah, please. 25, is it? Mm -hmm. No, same thing, these two, yeah. Yeah, sorry, is it not displaying? Okay, it's uh, it's displaying something different. Now, let me let me just go back. Twenty five, you said, isn't it? Uh, mm, this one, yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. In this one, the first uh, mm. slide, uh, this D figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. so can you can you tell? It is. It looks like spectral Doppler. So, like. Uh, how so do colors correlate with waveforms? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so basically, this is a spectrogram. Okay. So there are, it's a 3D model. On huh. the x axis here is the time 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, like that. 
and mm -hmm. on the y axis uh, there should be a frequency okay and yes. then you got power so um, so what happens so if you if you imagine that there are wave, waves multiple number of waves from here to here going all the time and they are stacked next to each other and uh, okay. when when the when the wave form say for example you are using propofol and uh, 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 remy mm -hmm. anesthesia and you will get delta waves and alpha waves delta waves alpha waves and there are hundreds of them lined from left to right because it's the time isn't it and then uh, you can uh, imagine some mountains and valleys and you can look at that from the top and then if you tilt that one imagine you're taking a picture of that mm. and then you're looking at that picture so that is what the spectrogram looks like it is a 2d uh, vision of a 3d model uh, okay. it's, a, it's a little bit of a difficult concept to, to get into our head first but once when you get it you get it right uh that's what happened to me actually so uh, once when you do that one on the right side here so you got time in minutes and the frequency on on the right side there is uh power so uh, if you look at the bottom here, there is there is delta there, and then there is mm. alpha, and you know this white line here. That is the huh. uh, signal, uh, sorry, uh, spectral edge uh, frequency okay. of ninety five percent, and this white line here is the spectral edge frequency fifty percent. So what it is is the the power is below that line actually that white line. 95% of the power is below that line. So that is one of the things that you can look at also. So the more we use uh, these um, spectrograms, more we understand them and the more we uh, can look at, like it's, it's it's like doing ultrasound or it's like, like a pattern rec recognition, you know? So uh, pattern, yes. You want me to show the next diagram also? Yes, uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. Yeah. This so in, if you yeah in here if you see exactly the same thing on the uh, uh, x-axis you have got the time in minutes and on the y-axis you have got the frequency and uh, because the frequency if you if you see uh, gamma is very high frequency and then hmm. you get the uh, get batted okay beta uh, the uh, low beta sorry high beta and then low beta when the patient is anesthetized the beta frequencies start to come in. And then you get uh, alpha and then uh, uh, delta, delta. So if you look at the waveforms, you will get, if, if you look at the uh, raw EEG, it's a waveform like a big wave. So they are all delta waves. And on top of these delta waves, you will speak. It's like a C waves on top of which there are small, small spikes. So uh -huh. those spikes are... Those spikes are, or they're called spindles, and those spindles are alpha waves. Hmm. So when you construct uh, this picture into a time fashion the way in a 3D model, it's a mathematical model actually, uh -huh. and uh, you'll get a diagram like this, and that is the spectrogram. So typically here you see a, a red band on the top, and that's the alpha wave. They're all alpha waves. And at the bottom here, you will see another red band, which is the delta wave. So if you look at anesthesia, if you do anesthesia with the um, Coflorin anesthesia or uh, propofol tiva, propofol remitiva, you'll get this uh, pattern. Uh, but with the uh, CO, you can also get uh, theta waves in between, like, like bluish line. Okay. So this means the patient is fully anesthetized. If yes. you see... Hmm. Yeah, this this patient is fully anesthetized. Um, and if you, and if, you if, if yeah, if you get full, uh, this uh, half of the screen is occupied by blue color. What does I know that that's, mean? this is this is this is because the patient is waking up at the end on this one. No, half of the screen is uh, occupied by blue color. That means patient is uh, awake. No, 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 getting no. awake. No. no, 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 no. That because the power is below that. The power is below the okay 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 yeah 95 percent of the power is see huh. here if you see the 95 percent of the waveforms that you see are below this line yes uh, this, 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 yeah it, it doesn't mean to say that uh, the patient is awake because there is some blue thing there no no yeah 
the 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 predominant ones are alpha, alpha and delta. Alpha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Does Vaisa, anyone have? Yeah, yeah. Doctor Kadu here. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have one question for Doctor Vinod. Mm -hmm. Hi, Doctor Vinod. Hi. Hi. Yeah. It's a yeah. It's a great presentation. Uh, many of the things has been uh, new to us. Uh, we have been using a uh, BIS monitor in our hospital. Uh, yeah. regularly. Uh, uh, the, the the few things which comes into my mind that uh, yeah. we have been using a conscious sedation also, uh, what we call yeah. a procedural sedation. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's not not hard. So what will be the use of this BIS or a process EEG in giving a process, uh, conscious sedation in the areas outside the OT, like MRI, endoscopy or a bronchoscopy or something like that? Do you yeah. use a process EEG in that conscious sedation also? And what uh, will be your parameter or the index? Like in general anesthesia, we say it ranges from 0 to 100. So what should be the range for conscious procedural sedations? Yeah. Nilesh, thank you very much for your question. Um, it's a, a very relevant question. Um, wh what I'm saying is that uh, it depends on what drugs that you use for uh, sedation. Um, if you are using uh, propofol, for example, uh, on a TCI model, then you can use uh, 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 this monitor with the, uh, the um, waveforms. But uh, the base number may or may not uh, mean much to you unless you know that the waveforms are good. Yeah. Um, but uh, do you do you use uh, base with the um, what do, what sort of numbers you are looking at uh, in your practice? Uh, basically, uh, there have been a literature uh, which has been mentioning the use of base in procedural sedations, mm. uh, but we have not been using. At our center, uh, for procedural sedation uh, mm. outside OT, we are using uh, medazolam and fentanyl only. Mm. Though mm. we are trying to use dexmed as well. Uh, yeah. uh, with propofol, we are not using. That we consider like a short general analysis or TUR totally. Mm. Mm. So outside operation theater ka areas, peripheral mm. areas, uh, I just, just want to know about the use of this. How uh, clinically uh, implicable it will be useful it will be to uh, monitor the stages of anesthesia like we categorize that as a mild moderate and severe mm. and the procedural sedation or conscious sedation we great uh, uh, stage it like in a as per the ramsey sedation score mm. or in a moderate uh, scale of uh, uh, sedation mm. so can this give a valuation on that that the, yeah. this index this will be a procedural sedation and yeah. can be documented in future if we are using more in the peripheral areas yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, very good question. And I think uh, you can use uh, BIS uh, and whatever uh, uh, you, uh, values that you may feel comfortable with, uh, you can enter them. But uh, believing only in a number is not something that I will go for. Um, because it is easy for us. I know I understand that because you need a numerical value, isn't it? To say this is good or it is not, not good. Correct, yeah. correct. Okay. But certainly it has values if you start using yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to be comfortable with it. And then uh, more and more uh, you use, uh, you will get uh, used to it. Uh, I have only used uh, this for, uh, say, proper fall sedation. Other than that, I have not used it because I didn't find it much useful uh, okay. to do. Uh, because I when I do the pain block list, etc., we give them uh, alfentanil. I don't, I don't I don't see a need for uh, using uh, uh, base on those patients you know so uh, but I've never used it with the midazolam or any other drugs myself no okay okay thank you Dr Vinod. Yeah, thanks for a great uh, presentation thank you so much does anyone have any questions for Dr Vinod? There are a lot of things on the chat here isn't it I don't know I've not seen the chat yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, one um hello no. This is Dr. Anil Parak. Yeah. 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 Hi. Hi, Dr. Vinod. Hi. Uh, I think hi, hi, the hi, number hi. which, uh, yeah, I'm the uh, at the Global Hospital Parel. So uh, I think the number, as the, we say, is 40 to 60 is anesthesia when you are giving mild sedation like midazolam uh, and the fentanyl. They are always uh, above 60. So the number yep. will be around 60 to 80 range. Mm -hmm. But if the patients are like totally conscious, it may range up to 90. 
as you give propofol for procedural sedation outside, then the number may be little less than the 60 or maybe like uh, 60 to 70 range. So that's a procedural sedation. Uh, uh, the other thing with comment is I want to make for uh, stroke, where the, both the topics were very excellent. And uh, particularly stroke now in India, in every four minutes, one patient dying with a stroke. So the number are so high in India. And uh, regarding the uh, uh, general versus uh, 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 conscious sedation or the sedation or the MAC, it's very important that uh, it is important to have uh, the blood pressure maintenance, not the type of anesthesia which is important like sedation or uh, the hyper this uh, general anesthesia. But there are a lot of papers which says that the blood pressure maintenance is the single most important criteria for the stroke patients when they are coming for the uh, mechanical thrombolectomy. And particularly, uh, the centers which has the uh, neuroanesthesiologist or the patient, uh, the anesthesiologists who are trained to treat strokes, there these are the center where the incidences or uh, recovery are both equal, particularly in sedation as well as in general anesthesia. So the importance of blood pressure monitoring is more important than anything what you give whether general anesthesia, sedation, or this. So many centers they don't give general anesthesia. There are many centers who don't give general anesthesia. But as a doctor. Uh, Augustine has pointed out that okay, it's a radiologist uh, intervention radiologist who demands there may be new radiologist or somebody who are keen to do under general anesthesia. But yes, it takes longer time and all. At our center, we have a code white uh, activated as soon as the patient goes uh, into the reaches to emergency. And within like 15 minutes uh, or 20 minutes, we get uh, the MRI, not the CT and perfusion images and the code is activated and within 24, 25 to 45 minutes our uh, patient reaches to cath lab. So we have a nice setup at the Global Hospital Paril. And uh, there are many cases as Dr. Augustine has pointed out uh, that uh, the recovery is on table and we had a lot of patients whom uh, we have seen the recovery at the, our table and it's very satisfying for the anesthesiologist as well as the intervention radiologist. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barak. Uh, Dr. Alvin, I have one query. Uh, can you give regional anesthesia to your patients uh, for stroke thrombectomy if they are very sick and unstable? No, if... if regional if they... means the scalp block and... Uh, no, no, I, I don't think there is a role for scalp block in this. If they, are, if they are very sick, then we need to assess whether this procedure can do harm. Yeah. So it is not that uh, thrombectomy is the end of, for everybody you should do thrombectomy. Somebody is with NYHA class 4 or uh -huh. severe hepatic stenosis or cardiomyopathy via NYHA class 4, you can do a bit. You can't give them GA and then cause hypotension, then inotropic support. All that is going to cause more mo morbidity. Yeah. So that time you have to address go for conscious sedation or just awake and try to do the minimal as possible. Um, it can also cause harm. So that doesn't mean that everybody should get GA, especially if they're coming a little bit late. So sometimes we just can't do. Uh -huh. We just can't. If they're very sick, if they have already aspirated... <laughs> They are in their uh, extremities. They've got COPD plus diabetes plus hypertension plus cardiomyopathy. All these are there. Then the 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 uh, life expectancy and the quality of life of such patients is already so low that you may not benefit from what you are doing. Yeah, yeah. So you just so one a, other comment. Uh, one other comment. I again want to make about Doctor. We know the lectures. He has mentioned that uh, post-operative dementia and all less as when you are measuring the, uh, uh, this monitoring. We had uh, uh, the liver transplant center at our hospital and when particularly patient coming with ALF, what we started using base and we th we had come across this, uh, that the requirement of inotrop has gone down. So many times when we don't measure the base, we give more deep anesthesia and the anotropic requirements are more as compared to the uh, when we are using the base. So that will help uh, the base is the other way uh, that uh, it will be unnecessary deep level of anesthesia 
and unnecessarily we avoid uh, hypotension, which is relevant to anesthesia. This is just a comment which we observe. Th thank you, uh, Dr. Parekh. Uh, uh, Parekh. Uh, yes, uh, but, uh, I mentioned that um, the use of uh, base and use of EG, process EG of any kind, will make us use less anesthetic, especially in elderly patients, because if you use more, then you may get uh, post-operative uh, um, delirium. Uh, some patients, some, there are some studies to talk about uh, other things as well, but post-operative delirium is definitely one big problem that can be uh, reduced and also the morbidity and mortality, yes. Yeah, Dr. Does anyone have yeah, I would like to say that both the presentations were very good and uh, we learned a uh, few lessons or few uh, new points from both the things. My query to Dr. Vinod that you mentioned that the spectral edge frequency increases as the patient becomes light. Usually the BIS does not predict recovery or it is unreliable at the time of uh, uh, lighter planes of anesthesia. So is SEF uh, more reliable or can it predict the recovery at the end of surgery or something during the sedation level or something as compared to BIS? Because BIS is just not reliable. Yeah, um, uh, thank, th thank you very much, uh, Hemangi. Uh, um, yes, well, what I was saying was that um, a, we have got a different way of measuring uh, the EEG. How uh, the interest started in uh, EEG was that uh, because EEG is very difficult, it's not e like ECG, isn't it? So there was a big uh, barrier for people to understand EEG and also to use it in clinical anesthesia. So the companies uh, did uh, these algorithms and uh, these algorithms were like almost like... Uh, you know, it is done for some hundred scenarios, uh, one algorithm. So this is just uh, like a uh, uh, a number that people can rely on. And that made uh, uh, the thinking of any cities a bit simple. And they jump into measuring or monitoring this. So I would say going by this numbers alone uh, is not uh, a very good way of doing it. If you don't have anything, yes, that is something that you have to go by. But, but uh, I think if you use spectrogram, it will give you a longer term, um, you know, like uh, it's like a it's like a trend over a period of time. So 30, 60 minutes or six, et cetera, you can have a look at the trend uh, rather than just using uh, seeing the best numbers on and off. Um, and 95% uh, of the power is below the spectral edge. So that's one of the other measures by which uh, you can see the trend uh, rather than just one base number uh, at a point in time. Uh, I hope I have answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Vinod, if I'm not wrong, the SQI should be 100 uh, before we judge the base value. Am I correct on that? SQI, no, no, no. no uh, uh, yes, 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 SQI, yes. Yes, yeah. that's what I was mentioning in one of the slides because it's the quality, isn't it? How is the, because it's if we knew how to look at the quality 100%, but we are dependent on the uh, machine to tell us that the quality is good. So if yeah. the SQI, which is a signal quality index, if it's 100%, then we can say that our uh, easy EEG waveform is uh, yeah. accurate or so near, near the accurate. Tells about technical integrity of the system. Sometimes the leads are not properly placed in the system. Correct. Uh, it absolutely. Absolutely. So absolutely. If you see that you're 100%, then only you judge the EEG, uh, so the base value. Correct. Also, mm -hmm. another thing that you have to look at also, Nilesh, uh, is to look at the EMG because if the patient is becoming a bit more awake, for example, and those frontalis muscles may be stimulated. So EMG uh, also have to be looked at. If the EMG is about 20, 25, 26, et cetera, then it is normal. But if you look at the EMG and if it shows 45, for example, that means there is interference from the uh, muscle contraction and uh, it, the base value that is displayed may not be exactly the 
value that is supposed to be there. Another one is, you know, sometimes patients getting hypotension, hypertension. Uh, if you use ephedrine, for example, uh, you can get higher base value. If you're using ketamine, you will, you can get higher base value. B, base is also higher with the nitrous oxide. So um, even though the uh, base is high, that doesn't mean that the patient is awake. So base value, you have to you have to make sure that you are uh, looking at uh, the base value in relation to uh, the clinical picture as well as, I mean, there are many ways of knowing uh, the depth of anesthetic, isn't it? You can uh, look at uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, whether the patient is sweating or not, etc. which we used to do all the time. But this is only an additional um, help that you have. Uh, I always feel like this. I always tell everybody, why don't you use base? Because we see sometimes people using Tiva without base. I said, why don't you use base? Because it takes the imagination out of it, you know, imagination out of what you're doing. So I would strongly recommend any kind of EG uh, uh, monitor, uh, base or a Messimo, Sadline, whatever you can get your hands on. Um, use it so that you will get more and more experience and then you know you, uh, that you can use it uh, uh, very, very confidently. Um, now, in the past, I used to use higher doses of uh, propofol and remifentanil. Now I use probably about, I may, have, mm -hmm. I may have chopped about one third of the dose or even one forty percent of the dose now uh, of uh, whatever uh, drugs that I used to use. Yeah. Uh, one more you'll, you'll get you'll get more confident. You'll get more confident. Yes. Yeah. One more situation where I find it useful is the intraoperative neuromonitoring, uh -huh. where uh, we don't want the patient to be light and not move. So to ensure that the patient is deep, and while doing so, we may inadvertently give too much of anesthesia. So monitoring yeah. this definitely helps in fine tuning the things. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This is exactly what I was saying uh, that it will take imagination out of anesthesia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaishali. Thanks, 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 Vinari. Any okay. other questions? No, I think. Okay. So I think we can finish off now. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Vinod. Thank you, Albin, Dr. Albin. Uh, it was excellent presentation, Albin. Everything you covered, everything, and Dr. Vinod, a detailed uh, explanation about uh, process EEG, but I think I'll have to still again go through it to get into my <laughs> upper story. No, no, we should thank all of you for the, on a Saturday thank night. You. No, <laughs> on Saturday, yeah. and you spared your Saturday. Saturday night, and... you're all sitting and listening <laughs> to this uh, topics. Okay. So, it's thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Pallu. Thank you, and thank you, Sam's Dr. Avinash Bosle. Thank you, Dr. Hemangi Nilesh. Ganesh, thank you very much uh, for giving technical support and all my colleagues from UK, Anwar, Hilal, Madan, Vaish, Agup, Dr. Deepak Shetty, is he there? Dr. Stanley, Pida Khan is also there. Thanks a lot. And uh, Gahan Bos, thank you very much. And my Anastasia colleagues from Navi Mumbai, thank you very much uh, for joining on Saturday evening. Thank you, Dr. Avinash. He is in theater. He's, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so sorry. I can't hear. Uh, uh, sir. I was busy. It was a marathon season. Uh, like this is third season continuous. Oh, my God. Okay. And <laughs> I would like to thank Dr. Anil Parak also for joining. He is our senior most neuroanesthetist. Uh, in Mumbai Global Hospital. Uh, so I thank you everyone and have a good uh, Saturday evening and I wish you all uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Okay. Thank you everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Vaishali. What a great presentation. Thank you so much. Bye.